Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with my July wrap up. And I think statistically, I actually read more books in July than I did in June. Shock of all shocks. But it has been absolutely horribly hot here. I don't want to complain too much because we have not had it nearly as bad as some places have. But it has been truly terribly hot. Uh, and this weekend we will be reaching some record-breaking temps. So I will just be staying inside and reading. Uh, so I suspect that August will also be just a month of reading a whole bunch of books. But coming off of June, which was just a massively great reading month, I think I read my favorite books of the year in June. Uh, it was just a great reading month all around. July, though I read a lot, I feel like I had so many forgettable reads. Let's go on and get into this list. The first book that I want to talk about is actually a book that I am still currently reading, but I am a good ways into, and that is The Twelve Caesars of Suetonius. This is a reread for me, and in fact, I don't know that I will fully reread it. I think I'm just going to skip around and read the emperors that I am the most interested in. The Twelve Caesars is an ancient classic that is telling biographies of the first 12 Caesars of the Roman Empire, and it's really just a whole lot of fun. I have started to tab a little bit. I think I was tabbing this the last time that I was reading this edition, and I just think it's a lot of fun. I enjoy Suetonius, but I have really struggled with the ancient histories lately. I feel like there's got to be something else out there that I really enjoy other than Suetonius, but I feel like comparing this to reading modern nonfiction, because I've been reading a lot of modern historical nonfiction this year, I feel like I just am not as in love with ancient history as I used to be, but I do still really enjoy Suetonius, so I do think I'm going to make a video all about him probably soon once I finish rereading the parts of it that I'm really interested in this time around. I started the month off with Hellbent by Lee Bardugo because I read Ninth House back in June and I just really wanted to move on to this while the events of Ninth House were still fresh in my mind. And I feel like a lot of people have been saying this year that this second book is actually stronger than Ninth House. Weirdly enough, I don't feel like that at all. I really, really enjoyed Ninth House on reread. It really went up for me. I thought it was just a much better reading experience on reread. And this was very different in tone and in theme and just in general in terms of plot. I feel like this just felt like a very different book to Ninth House. And some of the same characters that we really loved in Ninth House got more of a shine here, which was great, but other characters that we really liked, I thought didn't get very much at all. In terms though of this being kind of a dark academia supernatural series, this second book is far more dark academia in nature than Ninth House ever was, in my opinion. I just really enjoyed how this approached themes of dark academia. Our main character, Alex, is kind of at Yale by a roundabout set of circumstances. She has an ability that these supernatural secret societies want. And in this book, she is constantly thinking, if all of these supernatural shenanigans weren't going on, I could really focus on these classes and I could be learning a lot, which is something that she really desires. And I thought that was just a really interesting commentary. I really enjoy Alex as a main character. And I really enjoy Lee Bardugo's writing. I used to say Lee Bardugo was my favorite author. I still don't know that I would say that. I just feel like she has disappointed me too much for me to call her a favorite author anymore. Even enjoying Ninth House and enjoying this, I don't feel like these two are her strongest books at all. But I really enjoyed Ninth House and I enjoyed it more than this one. I'm curious to see what comes next. I then went on a T. Kingfisher binge I am obsessed with T. Kingfisher. She is definitely a new favorite author for me. And so I started my T. Kingfisher binge with Nettle and Bone, which has been living on my Kindle for a very long time. I think I picked this up on an end of year deal last year, maybe at Black Friday. This is a fantasy about a main character who is a princess. And it's very much fairy tale inspired, but this kind of turns the average fairy tale trope on its head because her goal in this book is to go save her sister from an evil prince. She meets a bunch of people along the way. She has just kind of a ragtag motley crew going with her. And I 
loved this. I mean, I was obsessed with this from start to finish. The writing is so charming. This was really cozy. I really do think I should have probably saved this for autumn because it was just an ideal autumn book, but I absolutely loved her writing. I fell in love from page one and I gave it five stars. I think I read it over two days. From this, I can see what people were talking about, but T. Kingfisher is, I think, more broadly known for the horror that she writes. So I also picked up, immediately after Nettle and Bone, I picked up A House with Good Bones, which is a haunted house story that is set here in North Carolina. And let me just tell you, I have never seen North Carolina represented so accurately in a book before. I truly could tell she has spent some time here. I looked it up and T. Kingfisher actually lives here in North Carolina and I said, okay, <laughs> she gets it. But this is really interesting if you want to think about it in conversation with Grady Hendrix's How to Sell a Haunted House, in my opinion. I think they came out within a couple of weeks of one another, actually. And they're both kind of approaching the haunted house story in the same way, kind of like with family or ancestors being the one haunting you. And so there's an interesting allegory in both of these stories about memory and about your ties to your family. What I thought was really interesting in subtext in A House with Good Bones is like the older generation kind of being pulled into alt-right crazy conspiracy theories uh, because there was a whole storyline in this about confederate statues and a confederate picture and i just thought it was really interesting because it was so clearly a commentary on what's been going on in the south here in the past few years so thematically i thought this had a lot going for it and i just love a haunted house story i eat them up every single time i loved this just for that alone but it's also really funny that's one thing i think i forgot to mention with nettle and bone is just how genuinely funny t kingfisher's writing is i think i sometimes struggle with humor in books because i don't think jokes always land for me but i definitely felt like in this case there were a couple of times i just genuinely chuckled i genuinely laughed out loud while reading nettle and bone in a house with good bones it was just so much fun to read i read a house with good bones in a single sitting and then that evening, I'm telling you, this all happened over a three or four day span. That evening, I read What Moves the Dead. And this is everything to me, my favorite book of the month, one of my favorite books of the year. This blew me away. This is a fantasy retelling of the fall of the House of Usher. I don't know what I can say about this that wouldn't spoil it because it is a retelling and it's a pretty straightforward retelling of the fall of the House of Usher, but it's also really short. This is a novella and normally I'm not really a big fan of short fiction. Novellas are very hard sells for me. Alongside short stories, I just don't think I really vibe with short fiction nine times out of ten, but this was the rare exception. The writing here was so atmospheric. The setting of the house absolutely incredible. I cannot describe to you just how good this was. It was eerie, it was spooky, it was atmospheric, it was everything I want out of a gothic book, frankly. And it really just gave it all to me on a silver platter. And I am sorry that I ever once thought that I couldn't enjoy a novella because clearly I can. This is one of the rare cases when I have read something that is short where I didn't feel like I needed more from it. I felt like this was actually the perfect length for the story she was trying to tell. I just genuinely adored this. There is going to be a sequel to this, which I think is kind of strange, all things considered. But if it is our main character, Alex, taking on another horror retelling, I'm here for it. I just want Alex to move around and go through all of the great horror classics. I'm here for it. It is genuinely mind-blowing to me the amount of character development that occurred in this, in this short amount of time, just how much we received. It is amazing. I mean, genuinely amazing. This is my favorite book of the month. I also gave this five stars. But because everyone has to have a miss somewhere, I also read Paladin's Grace, which is the first in a trilogy by her. This just did not work for me. And I have to wonder if I just am really set up to enjoy a lot of what T. Kingfisher has done more recently and if her older stuff is just not for me because this was really silly to me in a way that was kind of aggravating 
This was an adult book, but I'm telling you, these people acted like they were teenagers. I can kind of see what the vibe was. I can kind of see what she was going for. And I think kind of a lighthearted, fun vibe was really the idea behind this series. But oh my gosh, it just did not work for me. It really grated on me. The second half is better than the first because it develops into kind of a mystery, which is really interesting. But overall, this to me is such a massive step down from the other works of hers that I have read. So I am going to kind of keep up with her newer releases, but I don't know if I'm gonna go back to things like Sword Heart. Definitely let me know your thoughts on her down below and tell me what you think of her backlog, what's good and what's not. Maybe in the end, I'm just not a cozy fantasy person. I think this book is genuinely cozy fantasy in a way that Nettle and Bone was not. Nettle and Bone had some rough edges. Even though it felt really cozy to me, there was a lot going on. And this book was just silly to me. And I don't think that's a tone that works very well for me as a reader. So I'm interested in her backlog, but I definitely won't carry on with this trilogy. Let's talk about YN by Esther Yee, which I kind of recorded a reading vlog around, so I'll try to keep my thoughts on this one short. But I read this for K-Tropathon, and it genuinely felt like I went on a ride with this. This was a roller coaster because I knew when I picked this up, it was the lowest rated book on my TBR, which I just thought was wild. It's a newer release, so I kind of thought that's why. But then as I started reading it, I kind of understood why people rated it so lowly. And then after I read it, it's now one of the lowest rated books that I have ever read on Goodreads. So this is a very controversial book. I think people really have not liked this one. This is about the K-pop fandom, and it is specifically about a character who takes things a little bit too far in her obsession with an idol. And the first half of this is so good, it could be rated five stars. And the second half was just so bizarre to me that I genuinely don't think I could recommend this to a single person. It was that weird. The good of this is just how beautifully written it is. I think the bad of this is really the bizarre plot in the second half. This went weird and it went chaotic in a way that I really didn't predict from the beginning, but it really wasn't even fun. I think a lot of times you're reading these books about unhinged women and you're at least having a good time watching the roller coaster ride. But here, I really just was confused. The second half really left me scratching my head, and I really wondered about the writing process of the book. This was massively disappointing to me by the end, but the first half was so strong, I still gave it three stars because I felt like there were some really big highs and lows here, but when the highs were high, I felt like the book couldn't be improved on, but then the lows were so low, I was just left with a lot of questions about this. So I settled at three stars, but this one has still left me vaguely confused about my feelings. I also read The String of Pearls this month, which is a Penny Dreadful. And this is the first time that Sweeney Todd was ever mentioned in literature. And Sweeney Todd is one of my favorite musicals. So that's really why I was interested in picking this up. Last year during Victober, I read two Penny Dreadfuls and I adored one. And one was just kind of middle of the road for me, but I've been curious about another Penny Dreadful for a long time. And I felt like I needed something kitschy. I kind of felt like I was going into a reading slump here in the back half of the month. So I really wanted something that would kind of propel me forward in terms of plot. This is a shockingly short Penny Dreadful. This was only like 300 pages. I have to assume there was like a Sweeney Todd series maybe. And so he'll pop up again. But this is called The String of Pearls because it is specifically about a mystery about a string of pearls. If you were at all familiar with Sweeney Todd the musical, all of the main characters are here and all of them act exactly the way that you would expect. Sweeney Todd is a barber that will polish you off in the chair if you know nothing about it. And he knows Mrs. Lovett, who is a pie maker. Can you guess where I'm going with this? Weirdly, the first half of this book has very little to do with Mrs. Lovett or with Sweeney Todd. And it has a lot to do with Joanna, who is one of the main characters of the musical as well. But her lover went off to India and he retrieved her this necklace of pearls that he wanted to give to her. And someone carrying the pearls went to visit Sweeney Todd. You can probably guess how that ended. And so the rest of the book is them trying to find out where the pearls are in order to trace her lover 
and in order to kind of figure out what Sweeney Todd is doing. And I thought it was really good. I was really, really engaged in it. It was funny. There was so much going on in this that was genuinely hilarious to me. I did want a little bit more from the writing style though. I felt like this moved very fast and other Penny Dreadfuls you can complain about and you can say they're going really slow, but this one was short and I actually thought it needed a little bit more breathing room. I think I enjoyed it largely because I came to it with my knowledge of the musical and so I already had some built-in love for the characters and I thought it was just really fun to see how things started out for these characters. I guess one thing I'll praise the musical for is that it stuck pretty closely to the original, which is really interesting. But this was a lot of fun. I love Sweeney Todd. I might watch that tonight. I love the movie adaptation of Sweeney Todd because I love Jamie Campbell Bower. I was there before the rest of y'all. I'll tell you that. I was there before Stranger Things. Everyone's into Jamie Campbell Bower now because of Stranger Things. But I was there when he was Jace, and I was there when he was in Sweeney Todd. And his version of Joanna, the song, is my favorite. Speaking of fun thrillers, Let's talk about The Only One Left by Riley Sager. I got this this month from Book of the Month. I basically got it for my mom because Riley Sager is one of her favorite authors. And so I gave this to her and she read it so fast. And she told me, read this right now before it leaves my head. So I read it in two sittings. The reason it wasn't a single sitting is that I started it at 1030 at night. This is about a woman who goes to be the caretaker for someone in their town who is kind of a bit like a Lizzie Borden. She's been accused of killing her entire family, and this is set during the 80s. I did not know that before I started it, and let me tell you, that really just added to the vibe. I love it, especially in a thriller like this, when someone can't just text somebody because I find myself often wondering that when I'm reading other thrillers or when I'm watching shows, I'm like, why don't you just text somebody? But I loved this, loved the atmosphere. This was so V.C. Andrews. If you grew up reading V.C. Andrews, that was the vibe this gave me, particularly in terms of how the house was structured. I have read one other Riley Sager book and I did not like it. I think it was Home After Dark. I did not like that book at all, but it was kind of how the plot was structured. I don't think I had a single problem with his writing, but this one was so good and it really went there in an interesting way for me. I could not predict what was coming next. There were certain things that I knew, certain things I had figured out, but there were so many different reveals that I hadn't even considered when I was reading this. It was just so much fun. It was fun from start to finish. And that's really what it's all about. I'm reading to have fun and this definitely rescued me from my reading slump. I also have been reading on Kindle Unlimited this week. So I read A Ship of Bones and Teeth, which was an anticipated release for me by Karina Hall. I would say Karina Hall has got to be my favorite Kindle Unlimited author. I really enjoyed this. This is a pirate romance that is also a Little Mermaid retelling. And it's a standalone, which is just fantastic to me. I feel like there are too many series going on right now. I'm getting overwhelmed by the amount of series that I'm currently reading. Sad truth is, because it's about pirates and mermaids, I would have eaten this up as a series. I really craved more from this. But one thing that I really love about Karina Hall is that she sets things in the real world with kind of a supernatural bent. And I think that's something that I personally really enjoy as a reader. I really enjoy when our world has a bit of weirdness in it. And that's what this was. This was kind of set back in the 1700s. And it clearly is riffing on Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, Pirates of the Caribbean is one of my favorite movies of all time. So I was okay with all of the illusions made. And I think that really made this fun. It had the same level of kind of humor and swashbucklingness to it, which I really enjoyed enjoyed, but I didn't feel very much towards the male main character in this. I just think he was kind of forgettable. And I've read other Karina Hall books where even if I didn't like the guy, he was at least memorable to me. But this was definitely swapped. I loved the female main character. She really was vibrant and she popped off the page for me. But our main male character just didn't have much going for him, in my opinion. That's an interesting thing to say because we alternated perspectives between him and her. But I felt like I didn't really know him that well, even by the end of the book. So I gave this four stars. I really enjoyed it. I also read House of Beating Wings this month. This took me on a ride that 
I regret taking, frankly. I think I should have DNF'd this book. This is a book that is about Faye, so it's a Faye romance that is set in kind of a Venice-inspired world, and it is so long. I want to tell y'all this book is like 750 pages long. It doesn't need to be. It really doesn't. The kind of tagline for this book is that the main character finds out from a seer that she has a royal future. She'll probably marry someone in the royal family. In order to bring this about, she needs to find these five metal crows and kind of free them. That tagline is something you don't experience and you don't know anything about in the book until maybe the 20% mark. So I kind of think that was frustrating. To me, the pacing here was just not that great. It took forever to get to the point it took forever to get up off the ground, in my opinion. When it did, I thought it was really enjoyable and really fun. And again, this is a book I would say where the second half is very strong. It's much stronger than the first, but you have to get through so many pages and so much stuff that you don't feel like you need before it gets really interesting. Because in the back of your mind throughout that first half, you keep thinking, well, something interesting is going to happen probably when she finds one of these birds. Well, it feels like it takes forever to get to that point. It's a shame because the world was really interesting. I think the characters went through some interesting character development. I enjoyed the romance here, but otherwise this one just was a little bit disappointing to me. I don't think I will carry on with this series, but you never know. I just really thought the world was very interesting, so I might give in one day and come back to this. Last but not least is a book that I barely finished in the nick of time to include in this wrap up. Uh, and that is A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. This is the first in a YA thriller trilogy. I really, again, was reading this because I felt like I was just kind of slumpy here in the back half of the month. So I wanted something pacey. And this is, let's just go on and say it, absolutely ridiculous. It strains credulity. You can't believe 90% of what's happening, but my gosh, is it fun. Of everything YA that I have read recently, particularly just this year, I actually feel like this book truly is marketed to the YA age range. A lot of times nowadays, I feel like I'm reading books that are said to be YA, but they're clearly marketed towards someone like me, who was the YA age range you know, years and years ago when YA became big, but those authors have just kind of grown with us as a generation. And I think the real YA age range is sometimes forgotten about by authors. But this truly did feel marketed towards the teenage audience specifically, and I really, really enjoyed that. One thing though I'll say for this, it doesn't really look like a long book, but there are parts where this just kind of drags a little bit in my opinion. And that's unfortunate because I feel like about midway through the book, I was just thinking, when will this end? But then that back quarter was so incredible and it revealed so many things that I truly did not see coming. I don't know what that says about me. Maybe it was obvious to others, but I'm often not reading mystery novels, trying to figure out who the killer is. I'm just having fun. I'm along for the ride a little bit, but I do think this was genuinely innovative. I really did not see this coming. I got a box set of this trilogy, so I'm definitely going to carry on. I really appreciate the fact that it's a mystery that was wrapped up in this single book, and I think the other two books in the trilogy are also focusing on different mysteries, so I really think that's great. I have seen YA mystery trilogies where it's one mystery across three books. I just don't see how you can drag it out that long. So those were all of the books that I read in July. I kind of feel like I'm forgetting something, weirdly enough. But I had a fairly decent July. It just wasn't as much of a banger as June was, but at least I discovered T. Kingfisher this month. Wow, what an incredible author. I would love to know down below if you have read any of these. I would love to know what your best and worst book of July was, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.